Good afternoon. Pastor Bob here. We're continuing our series on engaging the world with the truth of Scripture. Tonight we want to look at the topic of truth, justice, and the American way. So I thought we might center our thoughts on a passage in, Mac, in Micah chapter 6. Now here's a familiar verse. I want to lead out with that and then we're going to talk about the implications of what God revealed to Micah in Micah chapter 6. Here's the verse, Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray. Father, teach us from your word, I pray. Help us, Lord, that we will hear you loud and clear on what it takes to have a society, a civilization, a country, a nation that pleases and honors you. Lord, I would ask that you would help us. We all bring our specific prejudices, our specific uh, desires to Scripture, and I'm asking you, Father, to help us to lay all of that aside and just hear from you today as we study your Word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As a kid growing up in Springfield, Missouri, I was totally into Superman. The TV show ran from 1952 to 1958, so I was 6 to 12 years old during its run. I tried to fly using a dish towel around my neck and, and used it as a cape. Of course, my mom wasn't too happy about that. In those days, it was pretty much standard dish towels, one of those ones that was about, I don't know, 14 inches wide and about 2 feet long or so, and usually white or some variation of that. I was completely fascinated with the restrained and responsible way in which Superman used his superpowers. He fought evil. He sought good. Why would anyone dislike him? Well, the opening lines of the show tell us why he was hated by some. And here's the way it went. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look! Up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman! Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel with his bare hands, and who, disguised as, a, as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. I just love that intro. As a kid, I found great comfort in the idea that there was a man from somewhere other than our planet who is fighting for us against the enemies of truth, justice, and the American way. As a background, you need to know there's evil in the world. It's ubiquitous and it's pernicious. The source of all evil is Satan, also known as Lucifer, the devil, the great dragon of Revelation, and the accuser of the saints. He is the real-life Lex Luthor who must control the world uh, for the satisfaction of his own ego, no matter the cost or the consequent outcome, he must be superior to everyone. He is blinded by his own rage and his judgment clouded by the fury of his disappointments. To him, man is an affront to his destiny and an impediment to his personal belief that he should be God and worshipped as such. He despises us because we were created in the image of God and he was not. Satan is a created being, not the creator. He has supernatural powers, but he doesn't have all power. He has a lot of knowledge, but he's not omniscient. And he can't be everywhere at once either. He also disdains the thought that he has limitations imposed by the God who is sovereign over all things. Thus, we are in the center of a great cosmic battle. Satan and his minions seek control of every power and principality, even heaven itself. This war is fought in eternity and it expresses itself in time and space by seeking control of the hearts and minds of mankind. World domination and the subjugation of mankind is the devil's goal. Stealing worship due only to the living God is his end game. As long as we live, we are conscripted into this fray. So let's talk about how we are to conduct ourselves in this war and what this war is really all about. And I think it comes down to three things, truth, justice, and not the American way, but God's way. Truth. People love the idea of truth. They just don't like its ramifications. Truth leaves no wiggle room to negotiate a peaceful arrangement with falsehood. Truth governs over justice and the American way of life. 
Without truth, every man will do what is right in his own eyes, which is anarchy. It must not escape your attention that Clark Kent in our story is a newspaper reporter, and he's squeaky clean. And the devil? Well, Jesus said it best in John chapter 8, verse 40, and then again in 43 to 44. He says, But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus is the truth. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The devil is a liar and a murderer. Jesus is God. Satan is a pretender. The truth only stands in reality. It defines reality, in fact. Thus we say that God is the true reality, and every competing reality is a sham, hoax, pseudo, phony, fake. So God is the true reality because he stands in the truth, and truth is defined by him. John begins his gospel with a fascinating passage. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And in verse 14 of John 1 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glorious of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In verse 18 of John 1, it says, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So truth is not a negotiable concept. It is a person. Man was created to reflect the glory of God, as told in Isaiah 43, 6 and 7. It is our highest good and find its expression only when we surrender our lives to Christ as Lord and follow him. Jesus prayed in John 17, 17 to the Father. He said, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. In John 6, 63, Jesus said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Unlike factual evidences, which often pr prove variable and erroneous, truth is eternal and unchangeable. And why? Because God is eternal and unchangeable. So truth is just one thing, God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Justice. Everyone cries out for justice. They just don't like it if a verdict doesn't go the way they think it should. Since justice is theoretically blind, there are those who are more than happy to lead her to her death over the cliffs of manipulation and perversion. True justice can only be accomplished when truth prevails. Perfect justice only exists if righteousness is the environment in which it is dispensed. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. You see, Isaiah is giving an order there. Before you can have true justice, you've got to have truth. You've got to wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. You've got to get rid of the evil deeds and you've got rid of, rid of all the things that are evil out of your life. Then you can seek justice. Proverbs 28, 5. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Proverbs, I mean, Psalm 37, verses 27 to 29. Turn away from evil and do good, so shall you dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Meaning wait for his decision. Wait for his justice. Come to him and learn how to do justice. In Isaiah 61, the first part of verse 8 says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. And then Leviticus 19, verse 15 says, You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. 
but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, something powerful from the Lord which we do well to remember. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So we see that, first of all, you have to have truth. Second of all, you need justice, but justice can only come about in the arena of truth. Truth informs justice. And those two things together provide the opportunity for what uh, Superman would have called the American way of life, but which we're going to call the godly way of life. The Constitution, along with the Declaration of Independence, outlines this concept. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Freedom from oppression and a level playing field for every citizen. It is government by the people and for the people. It is the establishment of laws that ensure the domestic tranquility and the public good. It is the granting of rights within a national conscience conditioned by truth and justice. Again, the linchpin of freedom is truth. Without it, there can be no justice, and without truth and justice, there will only be anarchy. Americans have come to believe that the American dream, that is to say things like own your own home, have a great job, make a lot of money, determine your own destiny, etc., they believe that the American dream is an inalienable right. It's not. But living in an ecosystem of justice, mercy, and a humble walk with God will most certainly open the door for that dream. Imagine a world in which people pursue greatness so that God will be glorified. Consider what it would be like if people cared more for others than they cared for themselves. Suppose people actually overcame good, I mean overcame evil with good. The endowment of rights spoken of in the Declaration of Independence had the Creator as their source. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are not entitlements, they are endowments. They are a sacred trust afforded to every human being. As such, each of us has a responsibility to live in humble gratitude to God for said endowments. This is a never-ending battle. The struggle will always exist. Just like in Superman, he fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, the American way. Uh, Superman and his story forges on, even against kryptonite, if necessary. With his last breath, he's going to seek truth, justice, and the American way. Okay, so that's a story in an antiquated TV show. How about real life? Our text invites us to consider what God says should be our modus operandi. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. Three things to govern our lives. Three actions with which to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and provide for the common good. Sounds a lot like the mission of the fictional character Superman, and yes, you need to know that we have our kryptonite too. Uh, his was a fragment from his home planet of Krypton. Our kryptonite is the flesh. That's pieces of our old sinful nature. In his case, only lead could shield him from its deadly effects. In our case, only the righteousness of Christ can shield us from the deadly effects of sin. The real superhero is Jesus Christ, who is both God and man. He is God come in the flesh. He didn't come because his home planet blew up. He came because ours is blowing up. He came as the way, the truth, and the life. And in announcing himself as the truth, he left the po no possibility of any other way for true justice and a way of life that ensures the tranquility for all who follow him. Truth is, and always will be, singular. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So I pose a couple of questions to you. First of all, what has happened to America? Well, first you need to know that truth has been crucified upon the altar of selfish ambition, self-promotion, and self-determination. The idea of absolute truth seems to have become a, a foreign concept. It's an ab absolutely unabsolute truth now that we talk about. It's obsolete to talk about absolute truth. So your truth is as good as my truth, which is as good as anybody else's truth. That's nonsense. Truth is one thing. It is God himself, the word of God specifically. So truth has been given away. Secondly, justice has become a victim of falsehoods, slander, innuendo, rumor, and manipulation. Justice of any kind 
is for all is beyond reach. And three, the American way is unrecognizable in the fog of greed, perversion, corruption, and self-serving individualism. There is no national conscience in America any longer. Well, that's not outside the realm of Scripture, because I want you to hear the rest of what uh, Micah and God were discussing in Micah chapter 7, the very next chapter from where we were reading in Micah 6, 8. Listen to what Micah says to the Lord. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered and when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished uh, from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hurt hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman of your punishment has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. I'd have to tell you that's pretty much the way America is headed. And to some large extent, it exists that way right now. So you see, this is what got Micah all uptight before God and why God told him the three things that he needed to realize were his responsibility. Well, God's not having it. In America, the way America is right now, just like in Micah's time, God's not having it. In Micah 6, the Lord's challenging Israel to remember who he is and what he's done for them. And he reminds them what they did with the freedom and blessings he gave them as his chosen people. They used it to sin against him. So he calls them to do five things. And I would say we need to do this too. Because a question you might ask me is, okay, so America's in a pickle. So it's in a bad way. What do we do to correct it? Well, here's what God pointed out to the children of Israel through Micah. First of all, review the Lord's indictment. Your sins have provoked the Lord. America, we need to wake up and realize that our sins provoke the Lord. And not to a good thing, to a bad thing. Secondly, remember what he's done. Remember what God has done for us. In Israel's case, remember what he did. He established them, he delivered them, and on and on, the story of how God kept rescuing Israel, that's a story in the Old Testament. But you know, God's done that for America too. In World War I and World War II, American Christians pleaded on behalf of God to spare our nation. And not only did he spare our nation, but he vaulted us in to be the number one nation in the whole world. Feared by those that should fear us. Loved by those who should love us. But what we did next is we used all that prosperity and all that success, and we used it just like Israel did. We sinned against God. The third thing is recognize what he requires, and that's Micah 6, 8, which we read. He desires obedience from the heart, my friends. And then fourth, reorient your life. Forsake evil. Learn to do good. Now, you know, if I said that to a broad audience, there would be people that didn't understand that what God means is, he means forsake evil, which are things that displease the God of the Bible, and learn to do good, which, is mean, which means we learn to do what the God of the Bible told us we are to do. So reorient your life. And then lastly, return to the place where you once occupied. God's favor was shed abroad through you. Return to that place by forsaking your evil, wicked ways and repenting. In Micah's time, God was warning of impending disaster brought on by the people's rebellion against him, which in turn put the nation at risk of being overrun by their enemies. We are now in the same position. We are corrupted by sin. Our actions indicate our rebellion to God and his ways. We are redefining good as evil and evil as good. Justice is perverted and anarchy is battering down the gates which have long protected our nation. So what can avert imminent peril? Here's Micah's conclusion, and I love this. Micah 7, verse 7. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah bets the farm on God. 
Since Micah can't personally straighten out the nation, he realizes that only God can, and so he completely abandons himself to the will of God, who is truth, justice, and the way of righteousness. That, my friends, is how revival begins. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Jeremiah 29, one of the most beloved passages in all of Scripture, verse 11 to 13, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now I should point out a couple of things from this. The first thing I would point out is that the nation of Israel did not listen to Micah. They did not turn from their sins and repent. And so ultimately, in 586 BC, the southern kingdom was overrun by Nebuchadnezzar's hordes. And for 70 years, Israel was out into the world living as slaves, basically, to uh, the forces of Babylon. That could have been averted. It could have been stopped. Jeremiah was there when it came down. You know, he was there when the invading army started surrounding Jerusalem. He saw all these things. And what did he get for his reward? Well, they beat him up. They threw him in a pit with mud up to his waistline. I mean, they treated him horribly. Now, I want to tell you what. I expect better, better things from America. So I want to tell you that it didn't work out for Israel because they didn't listen to God. They didn't listen to his word through his prophets. Secondly, I want to tell you that there are many running around who say they have the truth. They, they, they put their religion up in front and they say that this religion or that religion or some other religion, which is tantamount to saying my truth is as good as your truth, they say that they speak for God. But who has authority to speak for God? Well, actually, only God himself and the men that he appoints. In this case, we have heard from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God come in the flesh. Listen to him. In the New Testament, God spoke out loud when Jesus was baptized and when Jesus was transfigured. And he said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Now, my friends, that's who God is telling us to follow, Jesus Christ. Not just any old body. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, nobody else but Jesus Christ. And the answer to America's woes does not exist in any religion. It exists only in the truth of Scripture. Now, you can stick a title on it if you want to, but I think many people have misused the title of Christianity. I want to say to you that Christianity is a religion, but it is a person. There's a difference we follow the person of Jesus Christ, not some codified religion that has its rules and regulations, because Jesus Christ is the revealed word of God himself, and the Bible is the only source of truth about him. And so I want to encourage you, pray for America, repent of your sins, stop going your own way, and turn and go God's way. If you want to save America, and we all say that we love America, and that's a right and good thing to do. Don't wait for Superman to come and fight for truth, justice, in the American way. The real Superman already came. And guess what? He's coming back. And he's a lot more powerful than a locomotive. He, he is able to do anything, not just leap over tall buildings with a single bound. He is our God, the Son himself, Jesus Christ. Someday, when he returns, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And every knee will bow and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My friends, now is the time to turn to Christ. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Let's pray. Father, help us. Give us strength and courage in these days, Lord. Sometimes it seems like the forces of evil, Lord, are marshaled up and, they, and we are greatly outnumbered by them. And to some extent, Lord, that seems to be true. Because Jesus himself said that the road that leads to destruction is broad, and there's many people that are on that road. But the road that leads to eternal life is narrow, and few there be that find it. Father, I'm asking you right now to help those who are on that narrow road to keep being faithful, to march on, to soldier on, and be salt and light into this world. 
But I'm also asking you, Father, to turn the hearts and minds of people who are on that broad road. Help them to take the nearest exit for Jesus Christ, Father. Father, give them grace and faith to believe. Lord, save America. Reach down, Lord, and bring revival to America. Bring us back to the Bible. Bring us back to Christ, Father. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. Thank you, dear ones.